Hi, everyone, welcome. We're just going to let a few more folks into the room before we get underway. But I'm really delighted to, to welcome you here tonight. Do one more minute and then we'll get formally underway. This is always so much fun. These little Zoom seminars, the, the pause before the, the opening night. It's like, I wish I missed these, the, uh, I miss the sounds of the pre-show with the curtain and all the hubbub and just the, and that, the, that anticipation. The anticipation is still there, I find, but uh, it's a little bit different. We'll have to get a little like background, background audio to play that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly we should have thought of what would be the appropriate music for an intimacy intimacy setting um all right well i see we're at 602 so maybe we will get underway so um i want to say hello again good evening my name is Marlies Schweitzer, and I am a professor in the Department of Theater at York University. And welcome to the final event in this year's Performance Studies Canada Speaker Series, which is sponsored by the Department of Theater at York and the School of the Arts, Media, Performance, and Design, as well as the Performance Studies in Canada project, with additional financial support from Actra Canada and York University's Scholarly Events and Outreach Fund. Now in its eighth year, the Performance Studies Canada Speaker Series has featured the work of leading theater and performance studies artists and scholars from across Canada and throughout the Americas. Previous series themes have included methodological futures, moving bodies, living histories, and access, excess choreographies of difference. This year, series co-curators, Laura Levin, Jamie Robinson, Sunita Nigam, and myself have decided to skip a formal theme and instead invite scholars and artists who in their own unique ways are transforming performance practices, offering new approaches to the histories of theater and performance and holding space for others. Today's panelists, Siobhan Richardson, Nina Lee Aquino, Peter Hinton Davis and Michaela Washburn are doing all of those things. And I'm really excited to hear more from them about their work on intimacy and its relationship to theater education. Thinking about intimacy also leads me to think about the relationships to land. And so before I turn things over to Siobhan, I want to take a moment to acknowledge York University's relationship to land and its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat. And it is now home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably care and share for the Great Lake region. I recognize as well that many of you um, may be coming to us tonight or gathering with us tonight and living on other lands. And so I also encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the, the traditional caretakers where you live. Two more little uh, tiny bits of housekeeping before we uh, move, move on and, I, and we turn things over to Siobhan. Um, as you probably heard or you may have heard, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we have, uh, this is sort of for the purposes of, of uh, the panelists, but also we've had some guests who've requested it because they're living overseas. So that's exciting that um, folks elsewhere may have an opportunity to um, listen to this recording. Uh, but just, just wanted to let you know that. And also there is a chance, we have a Q&A box uh, as, as a Zoom seminar. If you ha have questions, you can pose those at any point. Uh, we will likely answer them at the end of the, the panel conversation, but please feel free to put those there. And then um, Siobhan will be uh, responding to them and, and sharing them with the panelists later on. So um, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a link to a video that um, hopefully if you've registered for this talk through Eventbrite, you will have received this. Um, but this is a link to a video that offers an introduction to um, intimacy, intimacy direction. So if you haven't seen it yet, uh, I'm not going to direct you to it necessarily to watch it now, but save it for later. It does provide some, some foundational ideas about uh, intimacy direction. 
So uh, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Siobhan Richardson, who has really uh, helped to bring this exciting event to life. So thank you, Siobhan, and welcome, and over to you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Siobhan Richardson, pronouns she, her. Uh, I'm an actor, fighter, singer, dancer, an intimacy director, and a fight director, as well as an educator. So it's been my absolute delight to be part of the creation of this uh, forum panel, and I can't wait for you to meet the people who are going to be chatting tonight. So uh, immediately, I'm going to, oh my goodness, I forget which order we said we were going to do this in. I'm going to throw this over to Nina Liakino, who will introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nina Liakino. Um, I am currently the artistic director at Factory Theatre, which is a theater company based in uh, Takaranto. Um, I am also um, a freelance director and dramaturg and uh, also the current president of the board of uh, the Professional Association of Canadian Theatres. Um, also an educator at times. Uh, I come into this panel, I guess, um, just from a director's point of view, having um, experienced, you know, um, directing um, intimacy, I guess, and working with intimacy directors, but also from a programming point of view as an artistic director, you know, making sure that the plays that do require that is often at the forefront of my mind in ensuring that the creative process um, is safe um, and that the actors and the artists involved in that process, it feels safe and creative at the same time uh, from an intimacy point of view as well. So that's kind of where I'm coming at. Thank you. Uh, Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Peter Hinton Davis, and uh, I am a director of uh, plays and operas, as well as being a playwright and a, a sometime off and on educator as it, as it goes. <laughs> and uh, I uh, have been in theater for 37 years, and it's interesting to observe how the role of intimacy and its direction and its dialogue has evolved and changed uh, and is understood over a period of time. And, and it might be because I'm, I'm uh, approaching my a big birthday. I'm thinking a lot about uh, old practices and their traditions and new practices and their change and intimacy, in addition to being about sexual, physical intimacy, uh, I'm interested in it as emotional intimacy and how we can gather together uh, in a connected way and address that. Where does intimacy reveal itself in an acting moment as well as in a physical choreography? So uh, uh, when I began, I was sort of inventing it as I went along, <laughs> making it up with my colleagues. And I, and I got the great uh, eye-opening privilege of working with Siobhan over the last three years and formalizing a kind of uh, craft around it. So I've, uh, I'm very interested in how that affects our, our rooms and how we uh, continue in our practice and how we evolve it. Uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in talking about intimacy as a uh, a broader idea than only a choreography about a, a sexually intimate moment. Great, thank you. And Michaela. My name is Shining Light. My given name is Michaela. I am coming to you from the uh, territory of the Nipsing Anishinaabek in North Bay. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I realized that my bio is there, so I'm like, I don't necessarily need to get into too much of that. Um, I am a professional actor. I've been a professional artist for uh, 20 years now, and I do have a lot of experience um, with intim intimacy on stage, less in the education and more in, in my profession. I'm fortunate that majority of that has been with Siobhan as well, so I'm <laughs> really, really blessed in that. Um, I'm, I'm curious and excited about the language of consent around intimacy. And I really enjoyed what, what Peter had to say in terms of 
beyond just like a physical sexual moment, but how we can empower artists to have honest conversations and, and for them to mm. feel empowered to, to be able to set their own boundaries and also their own flexibilities and that we, we can keep it a living conversation. And I'm mm. really excited that um, also as a, a member of the Canadian Actors, Canadian Actors Equity Association, I'm a, I'm a representative for the Ontario region, and I'm excited about what we've negotiated, um, Siobhan being a huge part of that as well, into our new uh, Canadian theatre agreement as well, in terms of, of including now intimacy direction as a recognized um, necessity. So I'm really excited with, with the potential and, and where, where we're going to go. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, before we really get started, the panelists had, uh, and myself as well, had expressed an interest in getting to know a little bit about the folks who are with us. So Thomas, our, uh, our tech man person, is going to drop in a poll so we can get a bit more of an understanding of, of who's here with us today so we have a bit of an understanding of who we're chatting to. So Thomas... I throw the ball to you to post the poll. And please note that the poll is anonymous. So you, <laughs> I think I just stole Thomas's fire. Um, the, the, it's anonymous, so you are not going to be recorded on this. We won't know who you are, who is responding. Uh, so please feel free to uh, be as honest as you would like. And in the meanwhile, the conversation we're going to have is going to be a little bit structured, but but very much about the the folks who are on the panel being able to share their ideas with each other about their professional experience and what they have noticed both in their workplaces, whether that be in the professional workplace or whether that be in the educational institutions they've been working in. And so the original intent of this conversation was to take a look at what are folks like me teaching in universities and in college settings, and what results are we seeing in the work in the workplace? And therefore, hopefully, we can take a look at what is working, what isn't working, and what do we need to what do we need to shift? What do we need to change? So I'm really excited for today to be um, to be poking all sorts of holes in what we're already doing, so we can move forward with with ideas of what's not working and ideas of what we can be excited about changing and the new, the new action we're looking to be able to bring in. So it looks like we are waiting for the poll results to come in and there are some technical things happening on the back end. So, I think in the meanwhile, maybe we can start talking a little bit about um, we can start talking a little bit about what are some of those changes that you've noticed over the many years. Peter, you had talked a bit about reflecting on what you had seen, and Michaela, you've also talked about some of the the development of uh, of like of language and of practice. So, does anyone feel like jumping in with a with a comment on some of those shifts that you've seen in the industry at large? Uh, well, sure, like um, in my own experience, uh, and I started as an actor, I remember like in the mid late eighties, there was this idea that um, you left your personal self outside of the rehearsal room. Like the, you were to sort of sacrifice or bring yourself to the larger process. And it meant a lot of times when uh, issues of consent would arise, you were just sort of to toughen up. And uh, I was criticized as a, when I was a young director by older directors for being too nice. They said, oh, you're too nice. You, you've got to be harder on the actors. And so I think we confuse an idea about or did 
a lot about rigor and about achieving hard things with this idea about a connected room or an idea about consent. And so that how do we approach um, the pursuit of difficult ideas and sometimes unknown ideas, but in a way that everyone feels connected to, or feels uh, free in that exploration rather than terrorized, which is largely what I felt as an actor. And uh, especially when it came to things of um, physical risk, I often felt scared and couldn't show that fear or, you know, um, and so it, it just sort of shut things down. And there was a kind of truth that evolved for me through experience, which was um, if you want stakes to be very high in a scene, you want the stakes in the room to be low. And how do we identify what the stakes of a play are with the stakes of what a room is? So whenever the room is really tense or really nervous, the scene gets really conservative because you're trying to protect yourself rather than the other way around. And so it's this idea, I think, of we want to have a safe space in order to do something dangerous, to explore a dangerous idea or a dangerous moment. And how do, I think what I've witnessed a lot is uh, just a more um, articulate uh, dialogue about that. Uh, a more, there's a language for it. An actor can say, this is what I feel uh, confident in doing, and this is I'm not so sure about it. We can find creative solutions to each person's entry point. And this, this idea of hanging your personal self outside on the door is so, was so commonplace, and, and it still does exist, that idea. But I think um, we've, we've really learned a lot through a, a generation of activists that have come to the theater as well. So that's, that's sort of how I observe it in a general way. Mm -hmm. Like the, some of the, like some of it is actually like the science that we're finding about how brains work and we're, but we're, it is also a lot about having more open dialogue about like my workplace needs to be somewhere that I feel I can work because we are emotional gymnasts. And it's yeah. important for us to be able to set up those circumstances well. Yeah. Um, I've often sort of come to this work with like a bit of a, a bit of a singular vision where I, where I think I'm offering like, here are some, some vocabulary tools. And mm. at the same time, a lot of my colleagues have been talking about this, like respect for workplaces at the same time. And the two really are so actually so intertwined not just for intimacy but for but for any challenging work that we want to uh that we want to explore yeah uh let's take a look a moment to take a look at those poll results so we can all get a sense of like who's in the room so we have a number of students a number of educators a number of industry professionals and it looks like folks have had like a largely uh, have had some experience with intimacy professionals or with um, and their experience with intimacy in education. It seems like it's a very lucky room or a very fortunate room or everyone's been in the right place at the right time. There's been a lot of people with some professional experience, some mm. functional experience, and a number with a largely negative experience. And which I think among us in this room, we know that anecdotally, there's been so many people with such a largely negative experience. Um, I do want to make sure we get a chance to speak to, to some of that if that comes up in our in our chat as well. And a lot of people's experience with scenes and moments of intimacy in the workplace has been has been functional, which sounds like okay, good, it worked. Um, and the aim, of course, is to take a look at. What is, what's the difference between the functional and the overwhelmingly positive and how can we move it towards that direction? So to, to take us from the, to, to start moving us towards that direction, um, any of the other panelists, would you like to speak to some of the growth or some of the change? I say growth, that's an assumption. Any of the, any of the changes or shifts that you've been seeing in your workplaces and, and in your own experience? Nina or Michaela? Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've noticed has shifted is the language around it. And as I was commenting before, 
um, the empowerment for the artist. And I agree with Peter. I, I think it's, I think it behooves us to imagine that we have to hang any sort of personal stuff outside the room when we come in because we are our toolbox. We are our resource. And so what the shifts that I have noticed have been the language and the conversation around it. And what it, in my experience, what it also has provided is a structure that you, you have a professional structure for your practice, which allows you such freedom. It's like Peter was saying, it's if I can create a place of safety where I know that I'm going to be seen and heard and respected, it allows me to take great risk and to make wonderful discoveries that otherwise I might not. And also that structure and, and the language around how we, how, we, how we create those moments in the room also reminds me that it's a professional practice that mm. to, to be cautious, to not tap into my own, um, I mean, we are our own resource, but it's not to, it's not to exploit my own trauma or my own life experiences to elicit some sort of response on the stage or in the rehearsal hall, but to remember that it's that, that structure keeps it in a professional practice zone and helps. That's also a buffer of safety for, for me as well as I approach the work. Yeah, so we're able to be like genuine and honest, but with that with that thin membrane of like making use of what's useful and not feeling like we have to dive into the things that are eventually going to actually harm us in the long run. Um, I, I think this whole idea, like responding to Peter and to Michaela of like hanging your personal selves, um, for me, it stems from like... <sighs> this whole myth of like stripping your identity, right? Strip to be your neutral self. And I really, really, really want us to get away from that. Like I, I, my goal now is to debunk the idea that there is a neutral self, right? And so all this time in terms of my career, like I've, and, and I felt really at, at times like, am I breaking the rules by doing this? Because I want everybody to come in full color with their fullest identities into the room. Because I think that once we know how to negotiate the differences, then each, how we how we consent, how we say yes to things, how we say no to things, how how our parameters can be set, right? That, that That's where real, real dialogue can happen. That's where voices can be heard. But I think this whole idea of like everybody coming to, coming to the room, like, uh, like I, I, I just don't know, like that's not possible. Like really to me, that's trying to create a standard and whose standard is it again, right? What are we measuring this neutral to? And of course it's not, it's, it's not ours. It's not my lived experience. So I feel like for me, the, the rooms that I've tried to create have always been based on some like on, on community. And that means that community in whatever kind of like room that I've created, like there are laws and, and rules that govern that community. And we need to make all, like we all are a part of making those laws and rules, right? And so whoever breaks that, then like we also um, create the consequences of that within that room. So so the freedom that you guys talk about like absolutely because it's it's not that um we're creating restrictions we're clarifying the kind of room we're in and clarity is everything right and it's assumptions that get us into trouble why we get into trouble is because we're thinking ah everybody's coming in the same they they've left whatever you know they've put their neutral masks on and everybody assuming that everybody's the same and everybody can communicate the same way and everybody's like uh -uh. like to me that's not that's never been interesting it's always been hella boring and i find that lazy um I, I think that, you know, why you choose your players from your actors to your designers and whatnot is is because of the collisions and intersections that can happen in that room, not because everybody's the same. And so I've I've really now in my older, <laughs> more experienced, so I've really outspokenly am, um, have come to reject that idea. And I'm, I often have to remind the artists that I am engaging with, even as an artistic director, is like, I want you to come in with your fullest self, bring all the baggages, and then we'll unpack it together. 
um, and I'll make sure that the room that we're unpacking this is going to absorb any explosion. Like I'll, I'll be there to kind of jump, <laughs> like we'll all be there to jump and, you know, and we'll be there and we got you. Right. And, but you're coming in on your own terms. And I feel like that's when the most creativity happens is when everybody um, has their own definition of what's at stake for them in their art and they get to define that. Nina, you saying that now, that's the first time that it's really sunk in for me, that idea of like, wow, if I, if I become something else to be in the room, just to show up and be at work, can I really be asked to have, to have agency for myself? Can I really be asked to consent for myself? Because I'm not actually showing up in the room. It's no, and we, we, in, in other circles, we call that like coding, right? Like we right. switch. So imagine, and again, my work, I will trans full transparency i've often worked in new plays and then with new new work that's created by bipoc artists that's like 99 percent of the work so so i've heard the horror sto stories from <laughs> from all kinds of experiences obviously but but yeah imagine having to already put on to code switch to kind of this neutral space which is never neutral and then have to perform like so you're like for artists of color especially for bipoc artists you're already putting on mask upon mask upon mask and i just the burden of that and and i yeah i i can't i yeah i don't ever want to operate in that kind of room I, so I it sounds wanna... like yeah, go ahead, please. I just, I just wanted to really echo Nina on on this idea of like stripping away all of this thing to like, I don't what what that is. I just don't understand because from why what, what I understand is when the artist comes to the room, what everything that they're bringing, those are their resources. So basically, you're asking them to toss out a bunch of potential tools in their toolbox as opposed to how can you learn how to use a hammer and the finest you know, a screwdriver, like how can you, how can you develop your skill with your tools as opposed to pretend they don't even exist? So I just, I really, I really echo that. And, and also I'm quite outspoken about that in my, <laughs> now that I'm a bit more long in the tooth. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it's like this collection of people. Cause I'm like, who's gonna, who's gonna loudly debunk all the things that, that aren't working. Cause I think that's, I've been reading Mindset by Carol Dweck and I'm just reminded of it. it's, it's, important and effective for us to take a look at what's not working and to name it um, as well as to to honor what is working so like for instance Michaela you were saying too that what you have found in the in the growth and the understanding of mm, let me put it this way in this movement that includes the rise of the recognition of intimacy direction intimacy coordination in that movement has included the rise of more awareness of things like rehearsal room agreements and like folks on this call have been doing that for a very long time. But as an industry, it seems that we're actually more open to that kind of language of what, what are the rules of the room? What, what does consent actually look like in the workplace, much less the actions itself? So as far as being able to create some of those uh, more communicative spaces, that's one of the steps that's helping us get there. And every room is going to be different, right? Like what I don't want to ha do is create a template, a checkbox of do's and don'ts. And I, again, like we, we tend to kind of fall into that once, once we, again, feel like every production, like, and for me, I always look to the work as kind of my, my magnetic north so to speak like what does the work entail what is the playwright trying to say or what's the like what is the intention of the play to know actually what the play needs and from there you build your teams from there you want to cast not just actors but the right as an artistic director the right director the right team for the director um and that's my job and th that's that that's one of the joys of my job of being as an artistic director but to make sure that no production is the same and they won't be needing the same things in terms of intimacy and and other things right so yeah so then in the instances where you're you are uh directing for a class so it's a it's a team that you don't get to pick mm what does what does that agreement look like or what does that agreement building or the room 
the building look like? And I know, Peter, you've got some experience with this as well. But, but Nina, like, mm. yeah. I, you know what, <laughs> and Siobhan, you've been involved in those. Like, <laughs> I, I do the, like, whether it's like I'm directing a factory or some other theater company or at school, and the schools can attest to this, I, I will demand to be able to build that world like with the team that i am assigned to that is part of my job as an educator is to share my process um with them so so even at york you know the 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 the, the production that i just directed a year ago two years ago i don't remember <laughs> what is time um <laughs> uh, <laughs> like it it you know it it was it was very important to me to be able to show my team, including yourself, like how I work and, and to be able to bring my most authentic self to the table, always, always. So that's something that I just need to make sure whoever is hiring me that these are my demands. Um, and these are the things that I will not compromise on. And so it is showing the room again, it's like I have to build a room each every single time anyways, again, because I never know until I know the work that I'm working on, what kind of world I'll be building with my team, right. So mm -hmm. I can I could just I don't have a template for that. It, it just needs to I just have the tools and then off we go and it's it's going to take whatever form shape and size but you know communicating and and bringing your most authentic self to the table um uncompromisingly and and just making sure that you know you you are <laughs> your most generous and kind in in a school setting pa patience right that it's you know but actually to be honest like it's it's not been too different from how I work in the profesh world and into the and into the educational world, like, and it's that's why I say yes because you are constantly, it's ne there's never too many moments that you can relearn, unlearn, and learn, right? So I don't know. Yeah, I think along the process too. Like speaking of some of the projects that we've worked on together, there is there's often these little moments of like calling back to the purpose mm. and the like. And, and recognizing like it feels like it went off in a different direction before let's refocus today's focus is um mm. i think that's where some people when we're talking about like workplace workplace uh practices um i think that's one of the places where people think it's going to be really cumbersome is we talk about the idea of checking in or like being with your partner, spending a moment to be with your your workmate before you are characters together. And folks think it's going to be this enormous derailment of the process, whereas so many folks have actually just been been doing that. We're just asking for it to be um, recognized as one of the elements of uh, being present in the workplace. Hmm. I think there's, you know, this uh confusion that can exist between responsibility and power and like actors what i think about all the time is actors have all the responsibility but very little power the actor doesn't get to choose how the play will be rehearsed in what order and how, how the, the design will be sometimes or but they have all the responsibility to deliver the the play to the audience and so where as a director, uh, where part of our job is to provide solutions for people. Uh, when, I, when I'm directing a play, I get asked 50,000 questions a day about how will we do this and how will we achieve this and what is your idea about that and, and where will I enter and how will I jump this prop? And how do we understand what our responsibilities are and what our collaboration is, like what we're solving together? Like no actor is a robot. They're they're a, a living, full, breathing person who might be able to help you in that solution. And uh, I know I have failed when I have felt it's all up to me. I have to do it on my own. I have to mm -hmm. I have to be the savior or whatever. Like that. that's when I fail. Is that that's one of those failed. things that? Is that one of those things that when people said you're like you're too nice? Is that is that one of the things that was that is perceived as too nice? The like well. It was believed at that time and by some still today that the director is God. The director tells you what to do. It's like that. If you think of what is the image of a director, 
and you, you know, I, I've done this <laughs> with students before, like to create a physical tableau of what a director looks like. Most people do that, like somebody pointing, talking, <laughs> telling people what to do, rather than I want to change that image for myself of someone who's present, who's really seeing, who's still, who's receiving and strong, who's also able to guide, to be observant, to see, oh, that, well, Michaela just did that. Yes, bring more of that. Like you're, it's an exchange that way. And so uh, it's interesting because what I've heard expressed about intimacy direction in a fearful way is, well, someone else is going to be telling you how to direct the play. <laughs> or something like, like this fear of a, of a power battle rather than another tool in the room. Like I, I have felt, Siobhan, that when, I've, when we've worked together, I'm able to direct more because I'm not worried about who's feeling comfortable or not or like who's feeling modest or what. I, I'm just looking at the scene. And I know you've got your eye on something else. So I feel way freer uh, as a director rather than uh, I've got a, a vibe for power with you about who's the most control. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that. Yeah, they're collaborative specialties. Like it's, um, it's, I, I've always, anyone who's asked me, I always see my job as like, as a, as a translator, as a supporter, as a collaborator in the room, it's my job to listen to everybody. So it's, yeah. to me, that is the ideal of like, it's someone, someone else in the room that helps to support all of those tasks that need to happen and help everybody do the job they need to do. Like Peter, what you're describing too, to me, um, verbalizes that idea of like the, the curator as the director, as opposed to, as opposed to that dictator but that person who notices yeah. and draws out. Yes, like, like, you know, I, I would love to be able to just say, you know, my, my process is perfect and I have this, you know, I have learned a lot through failing at it. And the failures we make as directors um, have more impact because of the responsibility entrusted to you. So we have to be really, careful and we have to be considerate and we have to be brave about our appraisal of how we're doing. That's why I think the, the, the sort of value statement for a room are good rules to revisit. The way I, like I do it at home. I have rules at home for how I, how I live with my husband and how we behave in a loving way to each other. They're not to control each other. They're to remind us of our, so our love can flourish and, and that's important in our practice too. They're really good to revisit. Like we all agree we'll show up on time. We all agree is an hour enough for lunch. Like those are the simple things. Um, and I think they're important to distinguish uh, atmospheric conditions to really sacred ones. Uh, by atmospheric, I mean, uh, it's really hot in this rehearsal room. We're in a heat wave. So maybe we need to take breaks in a different way, like things out of our control or um, which is different than we're approaching material that uh, we have unpredictable and mm -hmm. fragile responses to. So how are we gonna be checking in with each other about that to uh, knowing a day it's gonna be a very technically minded day versus that real unpacking that Nina, you were talking about, like, how do we ensure that that will happen in a way where you can unpack that together? And because we don't always know what we'll find. That's the that's part of the the pleasure of doing art too is moving into undiscovered turf. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a director, Peter, for me, the most powerful thing that I've I think come to realize and know is that as a director, I don't need to know. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. like if you're directing from a place of ego, absolutely, right? Like, it is about power. It is about like having all the answers or feeling like you have to have all the answers to all the questions. 
um, it does it, it then then your directing goes into kind of more practical functionary thing of like go over there and we need a window here and like even when you're when you're talking with your designers and uh, it's it's yeah I it's not interesting to me again I think that and it could be maybe the way I'm built or it, it's a cultural thing or whatnot but like even before then um, like I think community is something that I think about when when as a director and and as a leader you know I like there's this kind of mantra that I always tell myself like in order to have everything or to get everything that I want I have to give up everything and so that you know, when I think about that going into anything that I'm directing, it's it, it is like I see myself, yes, at the center of of the project, but with everybody else at my at arm's length, like that, that that can reach over to me when they need me as well as they're like when a designer is off to do their job and that also includes an intimacy like okay Siobhan and Siobhan and I even tag in and tag out it's like your turn and I can yeah. sit and I'm just if you need me if you need feedback like you figure it you know so the best one of the best things that I ever realized as a director is getting out of the way of like the brilliant people that you've hired to do their jobs right and and be the person that they need you to be for them right I think often it's like, I have lots of ideas about what the costumes I would like them to look like. But that doesn't mean I'm in the wardrobe sewing the costume <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, cutting the fabric myself. Uh, there's a partnership and exchange. I, I, there's two little things I wanted to say, and I, I don't want to hog up time, but like, one is, I so agree with what you've, you've just said, Nina, and yet, I'm very aware when I see a Nina Aquino show, I recognize your your mark, your style, your stamp. I could I can see in a show like Mean Girls, um, an attention to detail. I see how it's directed, so it's visible, as well as collaborative. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the other thing is, um, it's always interesting to me, because I teach directing too, is when. It's the best thing in the world that the director says, I don't know. And I see an acting company go, ah. Oh. And when a director says, I don't know, and I see an acting company go, uh-oh, nobody's driving the bus. And it's mm -hmm. there's no rule about, it's interesting mm -hmm. of when not knowing is the very thing to have. And I think that's so true mm -hmm. when we're in a terrain of, of intimacy, which magnifies risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely. And I think that I don't know, like I often will say, like at least I'll say, I don't know with swagger. <laughs> Versus, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Then yes, but I, but I've heard you too go. I know what this moment means. I know what this, but. I, you've said it to me about you said, Peter, this scene me. Like, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting because it's very show to show, moment to moment. And mm -hmm. that's where we need to be held in some rules to support us and the tools to yeah. put our creativity into action. So we've heard a lot from like the, the director's perspective of this idea of like the community and responsibility and power and such. And I'm wondering, Michaela, what has your experience been as an actor? Um, you had talked before about this, this change of language around consent and the changes in the workplace. And I wonder what, uh, what kind of things you've noticed and what you might have to say about these, the, the opening of language. Cause what I, before I really throw the ball to you, I want to recognize something that's kind of come up is that, as much as the industry is becoming aware of this wave of, of uh, workplace agreements and community in the rehearsal space and those conversational environments, it's I, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit with this panel because these are folks who who have been doing a lot of this kind of work and have included it in their practice uh, for some time. Um, so well, I just yeah, I wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, please. and that was actually something that I was going to comment about is is from an actor perspective. You know, going back to the, the the conversation around control, and in my experience, when it's been fear based, is when is when the person who is leading is is fearing that and is trying to compartmentalize 
this idea of, okay, I'll bring in Siobhan for like three hours and that it's this, it's its own separate thing as opposed to, no, it is part of the whole, it, it, it's part of the greater. It has to be connected. It has to be interwoven. And when I, what I've experienced when it's been problematic is when it's the idea of, well, I've been doing this a long time. Like we don't, I don't, what is this new fandangle thing? We don't need that. I know how to do that. I've been doing it. And, and fearful of this idea of the fact that you could come in and help us and guide us and help us build this container and this structure to work in. And, you know, that person fearing that then they're losing their direction of the room or they're losing something as opposed to, I loved what Peter said. It's like, you do your work. And then the director is much freer because I don't have to, I'm not trying to cling to control all over the place. And for myself, where I have noticed change is that even if you may have a leader like that, there tends to be a majority of actors in the room who we've had some sort of positive empowering experience and we're the ones saying, no, that's not good enough anymore. We're not settling for that. And we're not trying to threaten you, actually. We're all here to make this the best possible project that can be or the best possible experience. And I find that there have been times where the actors have actually allayed the fears of the director to say, no one's trying to take your power away. No one's trying to usurp your position. You are the guide. You're the one who's who's helping us hold this vision and, and contain it for us, you know. But it's I, I have noticed that actors, because we're coming with our own individual experiences, we have a common language together and there's a confidence in that to be able to speak to what we need in the room and we're able to support each other. Um, you know, I, I, I had an experience where it was like full nudity downstage direct address with the audience very intense and I you know I'd never done anything like that and I remember the first day that I was going to be fully nude in rehearsal and had a colleague who'd be like I'm not gonna get naked but if you want I'll take off my shirt and sit here in my bra in solidarity and I, it was really beautiful I didn't need it but I you know there's something about how we're willing to to really support one another in the room now that's helping to also shift the ecology of how the rooms are created because unfortunately not all leaders are are, are, are there yet. Yeah. I want to go further with this idea of control because something that came up in, in some of our previous conversations was when the language that has been taught around intimacy choreography then gets used as an object of control by, by some of the actors. Uh, do you remember, Peter, we were talking about how some actors take the language and then use it like, I don't know, almost as a, as a shield or something or as a way to down the conversation yeah do you feel comfortable speaking to a bit of that peter well it's um i, I guess in reference to like uh where uh sometimes as a director you're you're observing so you can see something that you don't know what it is to be inside of and that's a very delicate exchange of information mm. so and being outside is like having sometimes a bird's eye view. I can see what's beyond the thick of the forest the actor is in the middle of. I can see the clearing. So I'm going to go through, you'll be okay. But you can't see that when you're inside of it. And so uh, where does consent and risk and language about safety, that's why I prefer the word connected because mm. it allows me to explore danger and risk knowing that we're connected. And when I have failed is when that connection has been lost. When there's not a connection between me. And, you know, it's so interesting because these moment, moments of great risk, they never work unless the actor is committed to it. Hmm. Even if they fake it, even if they go, oh, I'll do it because I have to. It never works. The actor has to be behind, they have to go, the actor has to be like, I want to do that scene naked downstairs. Like, I want it rather than, okay, I'm doing it because I have to and I feel safe and mm -hmm. it's okay. And like, mm -hmm. it's not gonna work. It's, it, it, there has to be a enthusiasm for it. Mm -hmm. So how do we, um, I don't know, I just be honest in the language. Like they really recognize it as common sense mm -hmm. as well as a, a necessary tool for, for uh, freedom. It, it's hard when there's different levels intersecting with a room. 
Mm -hmm. Like I have taught, uh, I've taught in schools and directed in institutions where what's happening in the room and what's happening in other rooms is not consistent. Mm -hmm. Right. So somebody goes, I might feel safe here, but I don't feel safe about other aspects of the institution or the school relating mm -hmm. to this, or I'm getting a contradictory message in another component. There's also right, the psychological that, strain of that switching. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Michaela. I was just going to say there's also a distinction, an important distinction to make, I, I think, as actors to recognize that discomfort is okay. I think sometimes people yeah. are so afraid, like as soon as I'm uncomfortable, uh, but it's like, no, that discomfort is, is part of the process. It's making sure that, you know, we have those agreements and we've set up this container for ourselves to, to articulate and I, identify how to get through that how to navigate it, you know, we can establish safety in the room and it doesn't mean we're going to wipe out anything that makes us uncomfortable because that's when yeah. it just be, we can mm -hmm. just like censor the process and make it so bland. We, I think mm -hmm. as actors, we have to be courageous and be willing to experience our own mm -hmm. discomfort and be able to lean into it and explore it. And that's where a good guide is helpful mm -hmm. in the room, you know, because if you can spot like, Peter was saying, oh, you're starting, you're heading for the ditch there. You want to go <laughs> yeah. away, right? Yeah. So it's but I think, yeah, I, like, but dramaturgically too, right? This is where I, that's why I always go back to the script because I think that like, what does, what does this contribute to the storytelling, mm. right? Ultimately, and that has to be agreed upon, never mind you know like like that that has to be agreed upon with like the actor the director and the intimacy director right like like and and as a and maybe because that is the dramaturg in me kind of going okay like what what is this what is what is this moment about right and what is this like you know the the, the intimacy around this this thing like what is it how is it going to contribute to the storytelling? Because what I don't, sometimes what happens, we get lost in the muck of like all of a sudden the choreography and the needs and blah, 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 start upstaging kind of the needs of the scene. And we forget, you know, like, what is it? So it's identifying, always, for me, it's always going back to the beating heart of those moments and how, you know, being, you know, completely naked in that scene is essential because, and if we can answer that with ease if we are convinced if we have convinced each other truly between actor intimacy director and director like why it's essential then yeah peter you're gonna get that committed actor right you're gonna get that like and it's gonna be clear to the actor why that person why that character is doing what they're doing because it's connected as your favorite word is to the storytelling Right. So I think ultimately for me, it, it, it like if we get if if ever I find myself getting lost in all the technicality of it, I, I sometimes have to remind all of us, OK, what is this scene actually about and wh what is this scene in the overall storytelling and why are we wanting to do this again? Can we remind ourselves, <laughs> you know, before we start getting lost again in the choreography and, and the technicalities of it? Right. So, yeah, I so agree with it's, that. It's, like, I love I, essentials. Yeah. I'm ahead, sorry. No, nope, that's okay. I, I just was going to nerd out on them. Um, I love the moment in an intimacy rehearsal where you're dissecting what a what kind of touch, what kind of caress is going to further the story of the text. Mm -hmm. Is it a gentle brushing of the shoulder? Is it just a finger touching my partner? Like, I, I love because it's, it's storytelling is absolutely what is the story we're trying to tell. And it it doesn't just leave a generalization to like, okay, they make out or they have a sexy touch or some kind of generalized idea. Like, like what's a sexy touch to you it might be very different than what a sexy touch is to me. Absolutely. Or, you know, <laughs> and what is it for the character? Like exactly. I, I always sort of, you know, laugh and when I see like, you know, people making out like rock stars in place. And I go, wait a minute, these characters might have never kissed that person before. They might might be so interesting that the kiss is really awkward and modest and and shy, rather than okay, we're gonna 
titillate or something like what is the story we want to tell it's it's what you're saying you know about having that text with us all the time too of what our intent helps guide us when we get easily lost in, in exploring all kinds of things yeah i i will fully admit to have like gotten a little bit too detailed on the movement that we're doing and then the director saying hang on a second i think we've lost our way here and then we change it up it's like oh look the the scene is better the actors are happier because we know what's happening in that intent and when it comes to like teaching a practice of choreographing scenes and moments of intimacy when it comes to teaching that in our education i feel like that has been one of the largest benefits maybe not even the exact vocabulary but even just opening the idea that the moment of they kiss can actually be choreographed can actually be discussed because we actually need to discern what that story is within that and not simply say all right actors no one no one wants to talk you through this so just kind of do something while we while we coach you how to pick up a glass in the scene that we did yesterday that juxtaposition always didn't didn't make all that much sense to me before that language. Uh, we are just moments away from opening to our Q&A. So I just want to remind everybody who is uh, watching and listening, please feel free to drop questions into the Q&A and we will uh, start going through those as well. Um, and I also want to acknowledge like my, my initial intent on this being as someone who also tends to nerd out on things, my initial intent was like, ooh, like what's, how, how are our lesson plans working? What's, how are the, the, this comes before this and after this, and here's some language that we're teaching was kind of where I was coming from. But it just, it becomes so, so apparent that like the introduction that we can assess a scene of intimacy is, an important step, but none of that's going to work unless we actually talk about this workplace portion of it. None of that vulnerability in the acting of that moment is going to be found unless we have our practices of being able to access that vulnerability in the workspace, which is not a one person thing. I think sometimes we get the question of like, so how do I become vulnerable? Like an actor will say, then how do I become vulnerable? How do I make my partner vulnerable? Or like, how do I make space for my partner to be vulnerable? Um, but it does seem a bit, it still seems a bit microscopic. It seems a bit uh, focused in the, I've got to make, I, I, the actor, have got to make something happen, as opposed to understanding that it, it lives in this larger uh, ecology. Yeah, and going back to what Nina said, that it's not formulaic, you know, yeah. in terms of like every room that X plus Y equals Z, that it's not going to be that every time or every week. You know, we might have these conversations and we identify okay. this. And on Tuesday, it's terrific, but who knows what has transpired in my life. And, and Friday, it's going to be a different day and I have a different level of access, maybe less, maybe more. So it's remembering that it's a living conversation. And it's, I love too going back to what is essential for this story? What does this story need from, from us? What is essential? Mm -hmm. And that was, that was what helped me in that, in that role of being fully naked is because I knew without a doubt that it was, an, it was absolutely essential. It was necessary and I knew why. And that was what really helped me as opposed to getting caught up, getting caught up in, in, in it. And also the really helpful uh, recognition, Siobhan, like how you were saying in that moment, that was my costume, that it was, st it was still my costume. So to, to, uh, yeah. to allow me that, yeah. that it, it, you know, that was really, that was quite helpful, right? Because in that moment, that's what the costume needed to be for the character in that part of the story. It was so, so helpful, especially when you navigate people afterwards who are commenting directly on your body, which is, it, unusual and not something I'd experienced before, as opposed to talking about their work, they're talking about your body is very interesting. So, you know, you know, it's almost a paradox, but it's something I've witnessed in actors who are um, really, really wonderful to work with, which is uh, a sense of their own personal bravery, like they're each day come in willing to take on their extend their bravery. And at the same time, the greatest generosity for others' limits and boundaries. 
that they find a way to, I can extend my own bravery and I really can work creatively with, and respectfully of others' limitations. And so that sort of, I don't know, gives a, a freedom to this kind of discovery, Michaela, you're describing, like, it's, it's such a, you know, we, we, conversely, we live in a world, or I do, where I'm way nicer about other people than I am to myself. Like, I'll say things about my own body. I'll go, oh, you look so old. You look so terrible. I would never say that to anyone else. And how we extend that <laughs> into our, our own intimacy in our work is interesting. Well, especially when we, you add that layer of like someone putting pressure on themselves for like, I want to, if it's a festival, I want to be asked back. I want this director to work with me again. I want my castmates to like me. Okay. Like when we don't have that communicative space, um, then we've got all that extra stuff happening. And the science is that your, your body is budgeting way too much energy towards navigating the workplace when what we really want is a workplace that we can we can trust to be communicative and supportive and generous so that we can we can do that difficult psychological and emotional and physical work in the scene itself. We want to budget all of that. And we have to acknowledge we live in a world in which sexuality is commodified. And so that is often out of control of the play. Like that's just in the society. I, I see it when the, the gym is full of actors, you can bet that your patootie, a lot of them have to take their shirt off in a play or they're like, and they go, where in the script does it say your character is cut hot and has a six pack of abs? Nowhere. But that I understand the delicacy of, of ego, a healthy one and an expectation that they will be judged. Like the idea that you're, the nudity is a costume, that's a radical idea. That's a really significant, important, beautiful idea. Yeah, but it's sure one that I cannot claim. It's, it's one that I got from a, a, a colleague who had uh, had an experience of like, wow, I am, I am very nude in this and then shared that idea of me. Well, nudity is your character's costume. It just happens to be devoid of fabric yeah. in this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and we see this rule abused all the time where critics will judge an actor's body and a performance where the ways in which the body is commodified and appraised and judged is mm -hmm. a, a real thing to take on. Like it's, a, I'm not telling anything you don't know, but like it's. Yeah. It's a mental and, <laughs> and for brown bodies, we don't have to even be nude to be commodified. Mm. Right. Right. It, we're always right. we're always right yeah. it's the skin right. that we carry is already such a political costume um even yeah. before we put yeah. on the costume and what it means right so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a whole different panel but yes <laughs> yeah and one that needs to be had <laughs> yeah well i want to like move us a little bit towards the q a um, and again, in this, so uh, this is from James Finley. As an ID, we are often not always in the room. Any thoughts on how to create these connected rooms in that context and to help them persist in our absence? Um, so like, and this is one for me that has been a complex idea because at the beginning of my own work as an intimacy director, there was this, this idea that the intimacy folks were the, the ones responsible for a good room. And I always thought that that was such an odd idea because it, for one thing, I think it infantilizes everybody else in the room and removes their agency as opposed to supporting and creating a space. And uh, James, if I had seen that question even just a couple of months ago, I would have given you a slightly different answer. Uh, what I used to do was say, well, hopefully you're there on the first day and you can introduce some principles um, which is usually what I end up doing is I either speak on the first day or sometimes I have the, the incredibly generous gift of, of even like an hour's workshop to start through with some of these practices. But my ideal personally right now is to be able to be in conversation with a director and find out what I can find out about how they want to set up a room and how the principles that I'm offering can be part of that. Uh, failing that when you are working with a director who is a little bit more uh, uh, or who are going through 
Peter, what you were saying about students in university, where they're, where they're essentially, and Nina was saying it too, you're essentially code switching between when the intimacy director is there and when you're working the rest of the piece is at least reminding folks that around the moments of intimacy, they have an agreement with their scene partner and that they can support uh, their work with each other. And they have an agreement with their intimacy captain as well. And that person needs to be brought into that microcosm of an agreement. So if you are working in a place where there aren't those rehearsal agreements, you can create them in that microcosm. Um, but did anyone else have any, I mean, as the, as the ID, I sort of went, well, that one's for me, but I'd be totally open to other folks and your, uh, your experiences of how, how a, a, like a visitor to the room, how they can support or continue any of those communicative practices. I remember one of the things you also did, knowing, knowing that it was going to be, you checked in with me after that first day where I had to be fully nude in rehearsal and you mm -hmm. emailed me and you checked in with me to see how that went for me. And I found that really beneficial as well. Um, knowing that that was, that was a big risk that was new that I had never taken before. And that follow-up was, was yeah. very meaningful um, coming from you because I could, I could articulate with you if anything felt off in a way that I may not have been able to with my scene partners or with the intimacy captain. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I'll often do that as I'll open, like I'll open text conversations or I'll open emails and saying, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pester you, but I just want you to know this channel is open. This direct line to me is open. If there's anything that you want my ear for. I think for me, I, I, that that's one of the, the, again, points for me as a director that if, if an actor like you, you as part of my team, Siobhan, like you are part of the tribe, like you're not a guest, you're part of mm -hmm. the community. And so actors needing to check in with you like again i have no ego about that um you shouldn't have a, a, as a leader and so often i will encourage actors like listen if there are any questions if there's something you know we can you know that we can all like siobhan just throws throws away <laughs> oh we can always come back or you know and again it, it, it's whether you're there with us in that moment um but you're always there like again, like, so mm. my job as a director is to ensure that even though you're not there, you're there. And again, you're, you, you are part of that community. Um, and, and that everybody is empowered, including the stage managers, right? Because the actor might not know. Sometimes it's the SM that might notice that the mm. SM is empowered to tell me like, mm, something was off in there, like, you know, little intimacy rehearsal there. Could we get like, absolutely. And so, uh, clear communication, um, making sure that everybody is transparent um, um, and and is empowered and feeling safe to do so, I think. And I think that starts again with building that kind of room that you have, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like, I, I learned this from, from fight directing, but I think it's, I'm seeing the power of it is it's part of why when I'm intimacy directing, sure, I'm going to, I'm going to lead to a degree, but I'm always like making sure it's a conversation mm -hmm. among us. I'm, I'm motioning to my imaginary rehearsal space. Um, it's mm -hmm. a conversation among us so that it's, it's recognized, Peter, you said it earlier, this, this balance of responsibility and power so that I can hopefully encourage the actors to feel responsible for their part of it and to land in their power mm -hmm. for it and, mm -hmm. and see the equalization of those responsibilities and agency within that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question here. Do you have any advice for theater educators slash directors on how to encourage more personal choice and self-determination? Those are in all caps, choice and self-determination in how people participate or interpret direction or guidance of a particular exercise, for example. Well, it, it's a, it sounds like a quantitative question, right? That somehow uh, what the, the actor currently doing is not enough. And it, it's kind of a paradox thing as well. Like, it's like, we always say in a rehearsal, like, 
be in the moment, be in the moment. You've got to be in the moment. And the mm -hmm. truth is you already are in the moment. So how do you uh, acknowledge what's there? Like, we don't, you don't know what a risk is for an actor as a director. You don't know what a, a quantitative thing of a choice is. That, that what it, I think I, I would go to Nina's <clears throat> playbook there on what's the story? What's the play telling us? Rather than a, a comparative quantitative thing about more, uh, what is the play demanding and what's the, the most, the least blocked way the actor can make an effort? When you say the least blocked way, it, it reminds me of, we've talked a little bit about this idea of like further gradients, like clarifying what is, what is challenge versus discomfort versus like something that should block me. And when you say yeah. the least blocked way, it makes me think about like a focus around what is hard work. I think sometimes we say doing the hard work and then for some folks there is, uh, if it's, it, it becomes, unless it's hurting me, it's not good work, as opposed to it's, it's maybe it's, it's, we're looking for challenge rather than this should, I should put myself in harm's way, or I should do that stripping of myself so that I, I, so that I feel uncomfortable in an unsustainable fashion. And that's why, like, I don't buy that because that's not authentic. Like for me, least blocked way means the most authentic way. And that means like, so as a director, like I, uh, like, I know that I'm in a good process is when I feel my most, like my most self, like, do you know what I mean? Where I'm not tiptoeing around my actors. I'm able to be goofy and smart and, you know, say the words that <laughs> let, like, like, so I know like when a process going well is like when everybody feels their most authentic selves in the room and, and that's it like it's not blocked at all right so yeah. i i don't know i i i like when when you like you are already already vulnerable you are already brave you are like to be your mm -hmm. most self is a courageous thing mm -hmm. and 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 then you get to wear all the costumes and layer in and that's when i kind of feel like you are your most you know like the idea of naked theater right like because mm -hmm you're coming in as yourself and and allowing you have the power to you know reveal and and hide and what like it's 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 you and you um so i i don't know i i i kind of feel like when you kind of create that room then then the self determination and agency those just naturally follow suit i think um yeah i don't know <laughs> Yeah. I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this question's actually come up a couple of times from a few different people. Um, can you speak about what intimacy means in this new medium of the live stream theater? So we've got rehearsals, classes, and performance happening not live in a space together, nor is it in a recorded medium. Again, we would be together in space. But um, I could gas on about this one. So I'll step back for a second first, because I want to hear what you folks have, have witnessed about uh, or experienced about intimacy in the, in the live streaming medium. And I, I think it's safe to assume that um, we are talking about the two instances where you have actors in separate spaces being intimate, so in different windows, um, or where you have uh, very small collections of people, so folks living in one house as a for instance or maybe I, maybe I maybe I should start because I know I can like I, I have seen it I have seen it be such a prime example of the necessity of uh, first of all clarifying our shared workspace as well as each individual curating their own rehearsal space we don't have the luxury of creating a shared physical space which does a lot for for that gathering idea but now with intimacy acting together in separate spaces we have also a need to make sure that we see to our own health and safety mm -hmm. in our own spaces in addition to curating whatever whatever the parameters of the shared space are which means navigating things like how long has everybody been on camera today 
is it necessary that I that I look into the camera today? Is it necessary that I look at my monitor? Um, what what is the essence of what we are looking to accomplish today, in so far as the rehearsal space? Um, when it comes to the rehearsal and performance space, it it has the question: What does the script need? What does this production need? Has been forefront in every moment because in, in one we were doing um representational sex by like stroking the edge of the frame um and then like touch of self to to activate those mirror neurons so we could have the audience have that that experience of sensation with like while being restricted to solo hood mm -hmm. um and sometimes we've completely essentially taken out the stage direction and said well what's the essential story and then how do we tell that through how we deliver the dialogue or how we are in space? Um, so what does intimacy look like in the digital space? It's very much about what are our workplace practices, both shared and in your immediate space. And then as far as storytelling, it has so much to do with what's the core of that story and does it, has to, does it have to be told with that stage direction as written? It also makes me think of going back to how do you set up the room when you're talking about the shared space that we're in, like who, you know, how many people are from home or have roommates or partners or that sort of thing, right? What, how do we make sure that we're articulating that this is a safe space, that I'm not doing this and then your partner's over there watching, you know, when I'm in a theater space, we can put signs right. up on the door that, that, that create those safe right. boundaries for us as we're exploring the work. So to make sure that we're articulating those as well in these new spaces where we're all coming from 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 different places with, you know, potentially other people in our environments we're sharing with. Mm -hmm. I, I call it being mindful of your accidental observers or your non-consenting audience. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, that, else I'm, I'm, or yeah. that I may not necessarily be consent to be seen by who else is your in your home, right? Precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question of how do you deal with triggers for Generation Z as an educator working on a scene? I feel like this is another, it's not a one size fits all kind of response again. I just I would love to speak to um, some of the some of the um, like in play readings or, or workshop development when we've been dealing with really intense uh, content and we can't be in the space together. It it does go back to uh, how it's been set up and if you're uncomfortable, I really clearly identifying like you can through the chat or through the text or this person or this email like really having it clearly defined so that I'm not. Oh geez, I feel uncomfortable, but I don't want to stop this process in the Zoom. And how do I put my little digital hand up and try to wave to Nina? Like, so having those things really clearly articulated, I found um, work that I was going into where there was a bit of like, wow, this is going to be a heavy week, was actually quite buoyant and quite freeing and and quite rejuvenating because it was so clear the avenues that I could take if I needed that extra support or if I needed to slow down or stop or unpack something, it had been mm -hmm. so clearly lined out and, and we all knew what it was. And that was very, I found that very, very helpful in this digital medium. Like so the clarity of, um, again, some stuff I've been reading, I've been, I've been really enjoying my reading lately. Um, it's, it's like what, what we have been conditioned to believe is that conflict is a thing we want to avoid as opposed to accepting that conflict is inevitable, challenge is inevitable, and working to support and curate and grow and develop the tools for um, learning what that conflict is trying to teach us about what's not working and learning, um, uh, learning ways to then come to new answers, come to new understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I know some folks are like have been saying uh, we don't want to talk about conflict resolution because it's not necessarily that we're going to resolve the conflict. Like I understand the the intent behind that verbiage, um, and what I like about it is it then helps us to go. Conflict is not a, 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 a an evil thing to be uh, ejected or a problem to be solved. I've I've come to think of any conflict, any challenge is about ooh, what information is this highlighting for us. Mm -hmm. I think also to it, sorry, Michaela, like, I think it's, 
And I think for me, when I talk about triggers, especially with the artists involved, like mm -hmm. I don't, I try to like, even the word trigger already does something to me. So mm -hmm. again, I have to approach it from a dramaturgical point of view, right? Like why they're there, <laughs> right. like, and, and the necessity and the, like, you know, like the, the, it's function, it's, it's role in the overall world the, of the play and its role in the character and why trauma is, is there. like, so again, so when I talk about it that way, I'm giving a heads up already to the actors, like, this is, you know, like, this is what the play is about. And these are, you know, but without, again, making it sound like a laundry list of things to like shield your eyes from. <laughs> like, 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 do you know what I mean? And it's, it's just never, it's just never a great way to, to, to approach a, a body of work because I don't, I, I, again, like, I don't want us like, and sometimes it's not this, sometimes it's like, okay, like, I'm like, I'm going to hold your, like, I just want to be able to offer our artists and our audiences actually the choice, right? To like, either, if you want to look away, go for it. But if you don't, here's what, like, do you know what I mean? Again, without giving away, without giving away spoilers, without, but just recognizing that the triggers are not what define the story. And if you are working with a play that is all about triggers, then it's not a great play to mm. begin with. <laughs> like, abandon ship already there. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? If it's all you're talking about, then mm, I don't know. I then question the in overall integrity of the play. So, if again, your triggers are upstaging what the play is about and the story that it, we want to communicate to our audiences and we want to be interpreters of, then then, then let's talk about it in that way. So then the, the triggers don't, like, it's not that they're not gonna be triggers, but then we can, we can confront it again on our own terms. Uh, Nina, you remind me of this idea of like, what, what is our common goal? And this idea of coming back to the script is so much about what are we here to do? What's our goal with presenting this so that we have a framework for that? So when we do meet that challenge, we're like, right, I am here so as to tell this. And when we have set up that communicative space, then it, it, it's like it adds a resilience to it because we're not just sort of exposing ourselves to challenging things for, for the, you know, like just to bungee jump, right? Mm -hmm. We are, we're, we're there for that purpose and that, and that, um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, for that purpose. It makes me think of, um, uh, I'm always curious when people experience a play or a film uh, and they talk about like trauma porn, or they talk about uh, an exploitative quality to the ex explicit nature of something. And, and to me, that's sometimes hard to define because uh, I've seen things, I know exactly what, I have had the experience where I think this is like, uh, you know, <clears throat> gay trauma porn. It's just getting off on the victimization of characters and their suffering. And I've seen that. And, uh, <clears throat> and other things that in fact are more explicit, but I don't feel that because a consciousness is being brought to it. A light is being shone on it. There's a reason for it. Uh, as Nina's saying, um, and triggers are kind of like that too. Like, like I personally, I get very triggered by stand-up comedy, and it's not because, like, because I feel like something bad is going to be said, something mean and cruel, and it's all in the context mm. of joking. And I get, get, and I guess maybe you know, I have a therapist. I've dealt with like maybe it's because I was made fun of so often my childhood or whatever but so I've got to I, I know I've got to have some some guards up when I go into that kind of world but it might not be triggering for Michaela it might not be triggering for Nina and I have to allow for that too like so it's it's so individual I think yeah um one of the questions I wanted to answer here is how would you explain to someone that doesn't know about intimacy, what an intimacy director is and what it is that they do? Uh, very briefly, I, I think just because it's something I, I really like to make sure the industry is clear about. Your intimacy director is going to support your scenes and moments of intimacy. They're going to 
help discern what the story is, help in the creation of movement that tells that story. Uh, in some circumstances, it'll also be a bit of an acting coach because the movement and the breath work and the voice work for those scenes can be quite uh, can be a bit specialized. It can also be challenging for the actors and some folks um, welcome a little extra guidance in that. Whether that part of it be the intimacy director or the director, again, I mean, we're all collaborators, so I'm like, I'm not precious about any of it. Um, and that is separate from a respectful workplaces advisor. And in my opinion, uh, some folks say that they're intimacy directors but what they're actually doing is a lot more in the way of respectful workplace uh, advising or or respectful workplaces support where their job is about or they they the work that they're offering is uh, mental health first aid um, conversation tools workspace agreements um, some folks are even coming in with clinical specialties so they are the onset therapist or the in rehearsal therapist which can be offered but I would, I've kind of dovetailed your, your question into another. Um, so an intimacy director is often the, the choreography part of it. And on set, the coordinator has a lot to do with the logistics and the making sure contracts are happening and that kind of thing. But as far as that uh, emotional support and that workplace practices support, I see a day very soon where we're going to have like, almost like an HR kind of position that might support that practice when a room feels like um, folks in that room would like some more of those workplace tools. And as an industry, we are we are all growing our, many of us, some folks are already like, I've been doing this for a long time. Thank you for catching up. Um, uh, but for the rooms that are needing some of that uh, education and calling in. So that's how I would describe it. Um, that's us at just about time. And I know there are some questions here that didn't get answered. So as soon as we're like, the room's going to close, I'm going to see which ones I can answer. Uh, but before I turn it back over to Marlise, I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here and having, having such a great conversation and, and spending just spending the time with us to share what you have observed. And uh, thank you for everybody who has attended and thank you for your questions. Uh, I hope that this has been answering some questions, but I hope what it's really done is helped us to understand what are, um, what are our new questions. I hope that we've provided more questions and answers, and that I hope that this has been inspiration for us to say, this is, this is the exciting future we can move towards, um, and at least helped, uh, helped light some beacons and directions that you want to go or helped you see the fog for the first time. That might've happened too. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. Thanks. Th Thank, Thank you so much, Siobhan. And, and um, this is a conversation, I know we've been really fortunate in the Department of Theater um, at York to have you as a guest artist with us working on in both um, classroom context and on our shows, um, including um, Brochdale that Nina directed for us a couple of years ago. So we've it's been really wonderful to see the work up close, but also thinking about um, what is the future? What is, uh, where does this go? And, and with all of you as well today, thinking about your work as both educators and artists, how this is uh, transforming your lives, your practices, um, and also um, the way that you interact with others and, and support this whole new generation of artists that are coming up in this very challenging historical moment, uh, challenging in so many ways. So I, I absolutely agree that the, these conversations are gonna continue to evolve and be, I think, increasingly central to the work that uh, we do in, in universities and colleges and other training institutions. So thank you again for your, your wisdom and your knowledge and experience. It's so wonderful to have all of you here together. And Siobhan, this is, this is a, a, something we've been hoping to do for many, almost over a year now. So it's so lovely to have this come to fruition. So I don't know if you wanna squeeze in one last um, question or observation from the panel. Um, before we, we, we close the Zoom, um, but if so, this chance for that. Any final, final words? I, I'm gonna, I'm just, I just randomly looked and do you have any advice for students working on intimate scenes? Be Did courageous. I freeze? Uh, I can see you in here. Marley froze, yeah. I think, yeah. Oh. But go I ahead, go ahead, Michaela. Unstable. Yeah. All right, well, maybe we're on that. All I was going to say to those to those students is be courageous and speak your truth. Speak to what mm -hmm. you need, 
um, and and uh, yeah, just be courageous. Be be brave to to say what you need and to stand in your truth in that, and that will serve you much further than hanging on to a fear of reprisal. Hopefully, um, as our as our ecology is evolving, as we're becoming more aware and and wiser, I would say. Stay in your truth. Stay close to your core, and and operate from that place, and that will that will guide you. That will guide you. Marlies is back. <laughs> <laughs> People stuck around. Okay. Well, maybe I don't know if there's anything else to say. Um, oh, we're good. <laughs> all right. All right. Sorry for that. Drop it off. Thank you all again so much. And I think we will move to close uh, the Zoom. And thank you to Thomas Sayers, our, our operator behind the scenes, our, or as we were referring to him earlier, our, our Zoom dramaturg. Thank you, Thomas. Yes. And uh, wish you all the very best. Uh, stay safe and uh, hope to see you in person sometime very soon. Thanks again, everybody. We'll close in 10 seconds. Bye, Michaela, Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time. It's a great chat. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.